What I'm going to talk to you about today is only very briefly on the project that Carl is very familiar with um, as his, in his role as a, our project officer at the Gates Foundation. Um, I'm actually going to talk about a different project which was funded by uh, the EC um, and in fact had all these are partners here, so what I'm talking to you about today is not just mine or Cranfield's efforts, it's a, it's a real uh, consortium. Um, and actually, but I'm going to follow on for some themes that, um, uh, that Carl's already led, uh, led off on about talking about technologies and how you can't just take a technology and plonk it down, you've got to think about the full context in, uh, in which it sits. Um, so this was a, a real concern of the people uh, in this consortium. So we started our work by uh, thinking about some different technologies and how they uh, had been introduced and scaled up. Um, we st thought about all sorts of technologies. So we started off with something, uh, two technologies that were very, very simple. Um, so you can see them both in this photo, the hand dug well and the jerry can. Now, uh, hand dug wells are very, very simple technologies. They've been around for millennia. Um, and they can uh, provide very good water quality. Uh, this one here is probably not such a great example, but a hand dug well that's covered, that has a hand pump, can provide excellent water quality, and in fact is the preferred water supply technology of uh, several uh, major NGOs because it is so uh, cheap uh, and effective uh, and provides good water quality. The other technology in this photo, the jerry can, um, is ubiquitous throughout Africa. Anyone who's ever travelled in Africa sees that yellow jerry can uh, absolutely everywhere. Um, but it is actually providing a very simple uh, solution for uh, water storage in the home. No one's really even gone out and promoted it. It's just become the, the standard. Um, so that's, that's an, an, one interesting perspective on uh, wash technologies. Another uh, technologies that we looked at... Um, Maybe not such a success story. So um, the photo on the left is a rope pump, um, and the photo uh, on the right is uh, some of my students uh, learning how to uh, manually drill a well by well jetting. Uh, and both these technologies seemed very promising. They, uh, in some locations, they had really excellent success records. The rope pump in Nicaragua, very successful. Lots of people supplied with water. Um, but when it was taken elsewhere, it didn't, it wasn't successful. Um, when you look into it, one of the reasons for both of these technologies not being successful is the fact that um, because they're such, uh, they're locally uh, implemented, which is great because you've got um, building local capacity, much easier to maintain, etc. but the quality was quite variable. And unfortunately, in quite a few countries, these technologies haven't been accepted by local governments or by national governments um, as part of their national wash programs, which is a great shame because um, they're certainly examples of them being successful elsewhere. Uh, some new technologies um, just don't seem to be scaling up very well. Pit emptying, um, an example here in South Africa, the EVAC, but plenty of other parallel examples of uh, technologies that just don't seem to be scaling up uh, just quite yet despite our very globally connected uh, world and plenty of events like this. Um, some technologies we found in our review were just too expensive, um, for, especially when it was expected that users were going to be investing in them. Even the VIP pit latrine like this uh, was found to be quite, um, quite expensive, despite people trying to keep the cost down. Um, but still new technologies are being developed. We've heard about some great ones today. Um, I think there's some more this afternoon. Great to hear about uh, innovation going on um, and certainly something we're involved in as well. So I had one example that was brought to my attention recently. Uh, this is a uh, community chlorine generator. It's been featured recently by the Huffington Post and by the BBC. Uh, and it's uh, for generating chlorine at a community level that can then be used to treat water. The technology on the right is one that I am very, very familiar with because I'm part of the team developing it. Uh, this is the nano membrane toilet, which is in the reinvented toilets program that Carl mentioned. Uh, this is a toilet that will treat uh, human waste to uh, water and ash uh, on site uh, in the house. Um, 
but certainly something that people keep challenging us uh, when we talk about the nanomembrane toilet is how are we going to make sure that it's affordable, how are we going to make sure that it can be maintained, and how are we going to scale it up? Um, and these challenges are constantly in the back of our minds as we're sitting in the labs doing our, uh, our scientific work, how are we going to make sure that this technology can, uh, can be scaled up and can deliver the benefits that we believe it can? As part of the project, we also looked at new technology approval, um, and we found that lots of countries don't even have a documented process for approving new technologies. They might have some guidelines, they might have, um, they might have a process, but it's just not written down and people aren't aware of it. Um, one, of the, one quite shocking example we found in Burkina Faso, was that there were 12 different hand pumps being used. Now... <clears throat> Anyone who works in rural water supply knows that the major challenge for uh, hand pumps is the, uh, the supply of spare parts, so that when the hand pump breaks, you can get the new part in uh, and fix it, and that supply is continuing to that community. But if you've got 12 different hand pumps, that's 12 different supply chains uh, that, you need to, uh, that you need to keep going to try and make sure that the people of Burkina Faso have a clean water supply. So being mindful of these problems, the, uh, the consortium um, formed a, a project called WashTech, um, and uh, we worked in three countries in Africa, in Burkina Faso, in Ghana, and in Uganda, to develop a technology applicability framework. Uh, and we, um, over the course of the three-year project, we developed it, uh, and we tested it over three rounds of testing uh, in the three countries. So let me tell you a little bit about what it involves. Um, so there are four stages uh, to the technology applicability framework. Uh, it's first, there's a first a simple screening stage. Um, this is followed by a more in-depth assessment, uh, which will involve typically interviews with different stakeholders uh, and field work in a community where the technology has been piloted. Um, the results are then uh, collated and presented uh, to a panel who uh, finally make a full interpretation of the, those results. So let me show you what that interpretation looks like. Um, so we divided um, the, uh, the sustainability indicators into six. So we had, um, starting from the bottom, uh, a technology indicator. Does, does the technology actually work? Does it do what it says it's going to do? Um, what about the skills and know-how that are required for that technology to operate? What about the institutional and legal framework that that technology will need? What about the environmental implications of using that technology? What about the economics of that technology? Will people be able to afford it? Is there a good business model behind it? And what about the social implications? Uh, are people, do people like using it? Do people aspire to use it? And we looked at it from three different... Uh, perspectives. So the perspective of the user or buyer, the perspective of the producer or the provider of that technology, and the perspective of the regulator or the investor, investor or the facilitator. So that gave us all in all 18 different indicators. Um, and at the scoring meeting, uh, the group, assembled group would look at all the evidence presented from the fieldwork, from the interviews, and decide whether that technology was going to have a positive indicator in green, a negative indicator in red, or a more neutral indicator, orange, or maybe it was something that more information was needed. So critically, the technology applicability framework doesn't give an overall score, it doesn't give a yes, no binary uh, answer as to whether this technology should be applied in the particular context in which it has been, uh, that is being considered so a particular village or district um, of, a, of a country. But it, what we found was that this process brought up a lot of discussions because you're bringing lots of different stakeholders together. The, the usefulness was almost more in getting those stakeholders together to discuss, to work out how a technology could be improved, uh, to work out whether it should be approved for use in a particular area by a national government, by local governments, by an NGO. So the, uh, the TAF uh, is now published. Uh, it's on the website, and I'll give you the address at the end. 
Uh, but we wanted to try and ensure that it was going to keep being used in the countries where we'd done most of the work during the project. So it is now hosted um, in Burkina Faso, uh, in Ghana, and in Uganda by the organizations that we worked with throughout the project. Um, and we're pleased to see that it's, uh, it's been used more recently. So it's formally validated uh, biofill toilets uh, for use in Ghana. Um, so it was used by the um, Environmental Health Department uh, of the Ghanaian government to formally uh, look at the biofill uh, toilets and they're now approved for, uh, for use in Ghana. But WaterAid, one of the project partners, used it in Nicaragua. It's been used on solar pumping technology in Tanzania. We've had inquiries from the Philippines, from Afghanistan, from Kenya, for people using this, uh, this tool. So we're, we're quite hopeful that even though the project has now ended, that it's a tool that's widely available and that people can use to assess whether a technology is applicable in a particular context. So uh, if you want to access it, then the uh, URL is there. It's uh, free to download. There's some videos and tutorials about it. And of course, if you want to get in contact with me at Cranfield University, my contact details are there. <laughs>